In all the years I've been making Python videos, I have somehow managed to completely avoid talking about sets. Sets in Python are not only incredibly powerful, but they are also very underused and very easy to use, meaning that once you know about them, there isn't really a reason not to use them. Of course, at least for their intended use cases. As well as some of the more well-known use cases for sets like deduplication, you can actually unlock huge performance benefits by using sets in a specific way, and we'll talk about that near the end of the video. If you also want to know how you can create presentations, documents, social carousels, websites, and more in a flash, look no further than this video's sponsor, Gamma. Gamma is your AI-powered design partner to make creating all of these things a piece of cake. I task Gamma with creating a presentation on Python sets, or in other words, planning this video. All I needed to do was give it a prompt, choose my theme, click generate, and voila! You're now watching Gamma generate an eight slide presentation in real time. You can see it generating text and images, which can be edited in a single click, as well as some really nice human digestible diagrams to not only make the presentation more visually attractive, but more accessible as well. The slides it's creating here are called cards and are actually not restricted to the traditional slide format. They can change size and shape and be repositioned freely, particularly useful when creating websites and social carousels. Oh, hey, look, it's done. When you go to present it, it's even got these fancy little animations, which I think is really cool. Of course, if you need it as a PowerPoint, Gamma has the option to export it as one, which is really nice. And you can also share your Gamma presentation with your friends and colleagues. To get started with Gamma today, head over to gamma.app or click the link in the description below. But now that you've done that, let's learn how to create and use sets in Python. So before I talk about creating sets and working with sets, I want to talk about some of their features uh, that make sets what they are. So the first is uniqueness. Every element in a set has to be unique. You cannot have duplicates in a set. It's not possible. And this makes um, using sets for deduplication really nice. The second thing is that elements must be immutable or at least hashable. Containment checks on sets use hashes uh, to look up the value. So if the object has a dunder hash method or like immutable objects come with them by default, then they can be used, otherwise they can't. The third feature is that there is no order to sets. You can use a collections.ordered set if you need, but the default built-in sets we're talking about today do not preserve order of elements. And the fourth thing is while the elements inside sets must be immutable, sets themselves are mutable. So you can add and remove things from sets as you please. Actually creating sets is really simple and I've just like zoomed in my view by one so you can see a bit better. So if we do set one equals, and then we can use the curly brackets and then do one, two, three, four, five. And this is a set. So sets are defined using the same brackets, I guess, the same curly brackets as dictionaries are defined. The difference between sets and dictionaries is that dictionaries, of course, have the key and then you have the colon and then the value, uh, whereas sets do not. Alternatively, if you already have a collection of elements and you want to turn it into a set, then you can use the set constructor and then you can just pass any iterable over. So if we do three, four, five, six, seven, this will create a set using this list of elements as a baseline. If you want to create an empty set, you must use this constructor. So you must do it like this. If you try and do uh, it like this, it will actually create a dictionary. So you must use the set constructor if you want to create an empty set. Once you have your sets, you can then start performing operations on them. And this is where sets become really powerful. So the first thing is you have your union, um, which is the pipe operator. And this will uh, select um, all elements from both sets. The next is the intersection. Uh, and this is uh, performed by using an ampersand. And this will create a new set with all of the elements common to both sets. So this is kind of the opposite of a union. So whereas a union will have one through seven included in this instance, our intersection will only have three through five as these are the only three elements that appear in both sets. If you want to see some differences, you then have the symmetric difference, uh, which is defined using uh, the caret like that. Uh, and this will return essentially the opposite of the intersection. It will return all of the elements in either set one or set two, but not both. So it's an exclusive or. So it'd be one, two, six, and seven in this instance. And then you have finally your difference. Uh, which is calculated using uh, the minus operator like that. 
And what you're doing here essentially is you're removing all of the elements in set two from set one. So in set two, we have three, four, five, six, and seven. Three, four, five are currently in set one. So we then remove uh, those values from set one, leaving us with just one and two. Uh, this is the only operator where the order actually matters. So you'll get a different thing. Uh, you'll get a different result if you pass set two minus set one. And we can actually run all this now. We can see that the union gives us all seven values. The intersection gives us uh, just the ones that are common in both. The symmetric difference gives us just the ones that are unique in both. And then we have our two differences. So we subtract three, four, five from set one to give us one and two. And then we subtract three, four, five from set two to give us six and seven in this final one. It's also worth noting as well that all of these operations do have function equivalents if you don't like the look of the operators. So you could do s1.union s2 uh, like that and you'll get exactly the same result and the same with all the others as well. If we wanted to perform subset and superset checks that we can do that. So if I create s3, which is just two, three and four. So s3 in this instance is a subset of set one because all of its elements are present in set one up here. So the two, three, and four are common to both. We can use the greater than, uh, less than, greater than or equals, less than or equals, and then the double equals operators uh, to do this. So to save on a little bit of time, I've done the print statements uh, off camera. So this first one here, um, we are asking the question, is set one a superset of set three? And this is done with this greater than. You can see the side on the greater side is the superset in this situation and the side on the less side is um, the uh, the lesser set or the subset in this situation so uh, set one is a superset of set three um, because it contains all of the elements of set three and then extra ones on top of it so set one is a superset similarly you can use the less than to tell whether it's a subset if you want to check if it's a subset of or equal to, you can use the greater than, or this is a superset, sorry, for the greater than or equals, and then subset less than or equals, and then you can use the double equals to check if they are completely equal. Uh, and if we run this uh, now, we get that su uh, set one is indeed a superset, it is not a subset, and then we have all the other answers down here, including the fact that it's not equal, obviously. Again, if you don't like these operators, all of these mechanisms have functions available to them. Next, I wanna talk about adding and removing elements from sets, as I mentioned near the start of the video. They are mutable sequences, so we can add and remove as we please. And there are two ways to add elements and four ways to remove them. Um, so we have uh, set1.add, if we were to add six, uh, this would add an element to the set. It won't add it to the start or the end because of course sets aren't ordered. It will just add it to it. If we wanted to add multiple elements at once, then we could do set1.update and then we can pass um, an entire iterable through here. So this could be a tuple, it could be a list. I'm pretty sure it could be another set as well. You can just combine two sets together using the update. And this will now add elements uh, seven, eight and nine to the set. If you wanted to start removing things, then we can do s1.remove2. Um, in this example, we're just removing two. Or we could do s1.discard2. And these do the same thing, but have one very crucial difference. So remove will try and remove, in this case, the number two from set one up here. If it uh, fails to do that, because two is not currently in the set, it will throw an error, and it should tell us. Yeah, you know, it throws a key error. Discard does exactly the same thing, but it does not throw an error. You then also have s1.pop, which will just return a random element to you. Um, you can actually do that to set it to a variable, which is something you can't actually do with remove or discard. They just completely remove it, but pop, you can't actually choose which number to pop, I guess, because you would actually have to pass the number to it. But this will take a random element, uh, pop it from the set and then assign it to a variable if you choose to. And then if you want to clear out the entire set, you can do set1.clear like that. And this will remove all elements from the set. I want to quickly touch on comprehensions. You can create sets using comprehensions if you want. So you can do evens equals x for x in range 10. If x uh, modulo 2 equals 0. For those that don't know, this is a good way to check whether a number is even or not. 
Um, and then if we were to print uh, evens like that, we would get 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, as you would expect. So now that we know about sets and what they are and how to create them and how to operate on them, we can talk about their key use cases. And in my mind, there are two key use cases for sets. Um, I'm sure there are other uses as well, but these are the two that I tend to use them for. So the first, as I've already mentioned, is deduplication. If you have some sort of collection with uh, duplicate elements and you just want to get all the unique ones, you can convert it to a set and you can do that. Of course, you don't preserve the order. If you need to do that, you use collections.ordered set. And that has all the set operations, but also the order involved, obviously. The second, and I think the, the far more useful of the two use cases I'm going to talk about, is fast containment checks. Now, I mentioned near the start of the video that you could only include hashable elements in sets. And this is because, uh, much like dictionaries, when you go to look up an element, it will use the hash of the value uh, to look it up. And this is different to something like a list or a tuple, which will actually go through each individual element and check one by one, is this what I'm looking for? No. Is this what I'm looking for? No. Is this what I'm looking for? Yes. A set will just do it. And this gives um, lists and tuples O n complexity with lookups, and it gives sets O one complexity. And this works no differently to how you would do it with lists or tuples. So if you would have like x equals three, you could do if x in S one, and then print uh, whatever you want, uh, really, which is, in my case, is the literal string, whatever you want. Um, and you just do it like that, or you could have it um, kind of like this, uh, where you were to check against certain values. And you would do that with a, with a list or a tuple as well, just obviously with the correct brackets. But I have this um, graph up here, which I've taken from one of my Python but faster videos that I did actually quite a while ago which was uh, a time to find 500,000 times against a list in blue, a tuple in orange, which you can see is a little bit faster. And then I did a set and a frozen set. Um, and you can't actually see the line for the sets because hilariously it's underneath uh, the line for the frozen set. So the collections in these tests were effectively x for x in range 100 which is why you've got this number to find 100. And the further or the later in the list or the tuple the element is, the slower it takes for lists or tuples to find them. So from zero, you can actually see, if I zoom in, I could probably zoom in a fair bit, there you go, uh, that lists and tuples are slightly faster right at the very, very start of the collection. But as it gets, and I don't know how to zoom out, that is not doing that. <laughs> as the number gets further and further in the list or later and later in the list, it takes longer and longer to find it because it has to check again, as I said, each one individually. With a set, it doesn't do that. It just goes, is it here? Yes, or is it here? No. And it doesn't actually matter how large the collection is. So if the order doesn't matter, you should pretty much almost always be using sets for containment checks. So unless the order is absolutely essential for some reason, or the collection is incredibly small to the point where like converting it to a set is going to take longer than actually finding it, then you want to use sets for containment checks wherever you can. And you might even be tempted by frozen sets, uh, which are immutable, so don't have the extra weight of all these add and remove methods on them. So yeah, that is pretty much a crash course in sets. If you have any questions about what you've seen here, then do leave them down in the comment section below. If you want to see all the other ways that Python is awesome, you can check out the Python is awesome playlist using the card in the end cards. And I'll see you in the next one for Every Do Next.